Well, welcome. We're so glad that you're with us to worship. A special shout out to those of you at our South Street campus and our North Aurora campus. We're really glad that you're with us to worship today. And I'm glad to be here, at least virtually, if not in person. If you've been paying attention to the news, or even if you haven't, uh, you're, it'd be hard-pressed to find anybody who's not aware of the war in Ukraine. And some of you have asked or inquired, what are we doing as a church? How can we pray? How can we support? And you might remember that a number of years ago, our Advent project for Serve the World was a ministry called Stephen's Home. Stephen's Home is in Ukraine in a city called Kherson. Kherson's been in the news recently because it's just above Crimean Peninsula. Uh, it's been uh, taken over by Russian forces. And in that city is Stephen's home, a home for um, m disabled um, young men in Ukraine who don't have any other uh, resources or help in that, in that, in that country. Um, Elise West and her team have done a remarkable job caring for these men, loving them, sharing the gospel with them. And more recently, during the war, Stephen's Home has become a refuge for not just the residents of Stephen's Home, but for the people of, of the community who are seeking shelter there. In fact, we were sent this picture of worship going on in the basement of Stephen's Home. So I just want you to know, Chapel Street Church, the very resources you gave years ago to build Stephen's home, it's now being used as a place of worship and prayer and physical refuge from the shelling and bombing going on in Kherson. So pray for Ukraine, pray for the Christians in Ukraine, specifically for the ministry of Stephen's home, and we'll update you as we have more information. But we want to say thank you for your prayer and your support. I know it means a great deal to our brothers and sisters across the globe. Let's, speaking of prayer, let's pray now and ask God to prepare us to hear from his word. Father, we thank you for the way that you pour out your grace in our lives, and um, sometimes living here in a comfortable, relatively secure country, we forget that there are brothers and sisters of ours all over the world who struggle, who are in danger, who are in jeopardy, and we ask your protection, your provision. Lord, we pray against the schemes of evil men who make war on the earth, that you, Lord, are the Lord of all nations, and we ask you to stop this war by any means necessary and to protect and preserve innocent lives. We pray specifically for the work you're doing in Stephen's home, uh, for the protection of the people sheltering there, even in the basement, singing your praises, crying out to you for help and for aid. Lord, protect them and preserve their lives. Lord, bring through this crisis opportunities for your gospel, that many would reach out and cry out to you, whether Russian soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers, civilians, uh, world leaders, God, that they would reach out uh, for help beyond this world that only you can provide. Now, God, we turn our hearts and our minds to your word, and we ask you to speak to us. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, we're in a series called Following the King as we're marching toward Easter, following the path of Jesus from the Gospel of Mark as he is in the last days of his life on earth. And we're going to look at a remarkable story from Mark's Gospel in chapter 14 in a few moments. But first, you know, I, I just want to uh, set this up with a... a commenting on a movie scene that will probably be familiar to many of you. I'm sure many of you have seen the movie Titanic. Uh, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, he's the, and, and the famous love story and the sto story of the sinking of the ship. But there's a scene at the end of the movie where Rose is an old woman now, some 50, 60 years after the, the, the Titanic went down. And she has this diamond uh, necklace called the Heart of the Ocean, which is part of the story. And they say that it's worth $400 million, the Heart of the Ocean. And at the, in the scene, she's standing on the back of the Titanic, the ship, uh, in her nightgown, and she throws this $400 million Heart of the Ocean necklace into the ocean, and it sinks to the bottom. I remember seeing that scene and being so angry. I mean, maybe you watched it and you thought it was romantic. Many people in the theater thought it was romantic. I remember looking around, people are crying. Let me just tell you, that was not romantic. That was totally foolish. I remember thinking, no, what are you doing? Somebody stop this woman. It's not worth it. Jack is not worth it. Your, your, fling, your, your teenage fling from 60 years ago is not worth wasting that amount of money. But nevertheless, she did that. So that question, is it worth it? Uh, is he worth it? is at the heart of the story we're going to examine from Mark chapter 14. Is he worth it? The story in the Gospel of Mark. Last week, we saw Pastor Sterling and Pastor Brian preached to us about the Olivet Discourse. Jesus speaking about the end times and promising to return in glory and establish his kingdom. And we live in between, warning us that we're not to know the day or the hour. And then the chapter 13 ends with him saying, stay awake. 
what I say to you, Jesus says, I say to all, stay awake. And we learned that staying awake doesn't mean trying to decode the events of, of what's happening in, in our culture or in the world, current events. It doesn't mean trying to determine the exact time of his return. He says you won't know. Stay awake means focusing on the king. What Jesus says in Matthew 6, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to us. That's what it means to stay awake. And then, so chapter 13 ends with this note of hope of his triumphant, glorious return someday. Chapter 13 begins with a very different tone. The mood shifts into what uh, biblical scholars refer to as his passion. And the, historically, traditionally, the passion of Jesus refers to his suffering. All the events, his betrayal, his arrest, his trial, his beatings, his crucifixion, that is the passion of Christ. We don't tend to connect passion with suffering in our culture. We think of passion as something you're really excited about or you care a lot about. But for Jesus, his passion is connected deeply to his suffering, that which he cares most about, doing the will of the Father, accomplishing the purpose for which he came, to give his life as a ransom for many, we learned in Mark 10, verse 45. That is his passion, and it involves his suffering. So we're going to look at how the story begins. Remember, Jesus closes chapter 13 saying, stay awake. Here's how chapter 14 begins, verses 1 and 2. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. How interesting that Jesus says, hey, stay awake. And the next two verses are about a plot to take his life. And we know that later when they're in the garden, he's also urging the disciples actually physically, literally, stay awake. There's this plot going on, the plot to arrest and kill Jesus right after the call to stay awake. So the chief priests are seeking to and plotting and scheming how can they find a way to arrest him? How can they ultimately kill him, get rid of him? And I want you to notice something, and we won't have time to go into all these details, but if you read through Mark chapter 14 and following through the, the end of through the crucifixion, all of the events from God's perspective in heaven are proceeding according to divine plan. The, the triumphal entry, the cleansing of the temple, the, the feast of unleavened bread, the Passover feast, the Last Supper was prepared ahead of time, the preparing of the disciples for what's to come, all of it is being prepared and proceeding according to God's plan from heaven's perspective, but from the perspective of those on earth, the disciples, it feels like confusion and chaos. Nothing is making sense. But, and that's good for us to remember that sometimes when it feels most confusing and chaotic is God's in control. Things aren't out of his control. He's, it's still marching according to his ultimate divine plan. And we also see that, so the, the, the chief priests are preparing and plotting to take his life but God is preparing to have his son offered as a sacrifice who takes away the sin of the world. And so that's, there's this contrast going on. Let's look at verses 3 through 9, because uh, as we read through this story, at the end, we're going to see that verses 11 and 12 are the story of Judas betraying Jesus. So you have the plot to kill him and the agreement to betray him. And sandwiched in between is the story we're going to read now. And while he was at Bethany... In the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you will always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. This is the story of Jesus anointing uh, at Bethany. And it's, again, it's sandwiched between the plot to kill him and the agreement to betray him. And those two stories are linked. And in between, we have this story of his anointing, which seems a little bit out of place, but it's not. 
John's gospel gives us a few more details about this story, about this dinner party. So Jesus is having dinner at this person's house, Simon the leper, and John fills in a few of the details for us when he gives us his account in verses 1 and 2. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Now, in case you're new to the Gospels uh, and studying this, Bethany is outside of Jerusalem, not far away. Jesus, during the last weeks of his life, would often spend his day in the temple courts and in Jerusalem in the city, and then go outside the city and, and stay in Bethany. You remember in John chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead earlier. So Lazarus is there. Lazarus has two sisters, Mary and Martha. They are there. And this, it's in the home of this man named Simon the leper. Now, <laughs> that's an unfortunate nickname, right? Simon the leper. He clearly didn't currently have leprosy or you couldn't be in his house and he wouldn't have had a home. He's most likely someone Jesus has healed the same way he raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, think about that for a minute. What a dinner party this would have been to attend. You've got Simon the leper. He, he's probably saying like, man, when I was a leper, it was such a drag. But Jesus healed me. He's cleansed me. And look at this. I have a home. I can throw a party. I invite all of my wonderful friends and guests over to be with our, our rabbi, our master, our savior, Jesus. And then Lazarus is probably like, yeah, yeah, that's nothing, Simon. I was dead. I was in the grave. And he brought me out again. And Mary and Martha are there to attest to this. Martha, she's busy serving. Mary is busy Worshiping Jesus, as we'll see. She's the central character in the story outside of Jesus. Mark doesn't give us her name, but John does. Mary is the one who brings this alabaster flask of ointment and pours it out all over Jesus. That that's who this, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. And what she does for Jesus is really the center of the story. It's what the whole story turns around, this act of worship and devotion. This shocking act, this extravagant act of devotion. She brings an alabaster flask of pure nard. Uh, the old King James calls it spike nard. Comes from uh, the region in, in India, in the Himalayas, actually. It, think about the, about the most expensive essential oil today, times 100. It, was the, it had a, a pungent odor, fragrant odor, that even a tiny drop would fill the area around that drop with with. The scent. And the, that scent was, it was uh, indicative in the ancient world of the very best. So the smell, the odor of pure nard was a symbol of the very best in that culture. Kind of like maybe a Tiffany diamond is the best we have to offer, that sort of thing. Like people recognize the smell and thought, oh, this is wealthy, this is important, this is special. And she brings an alabaster flask. Now, the flask itself made of alabaster was valuable itself. And the fact that it's full of this ointment, which only a drop would, would fill the room with this scent, means it was extremely valuable. Most likely, it's a family heirloom, the flask and the ointment inside of it, passed down from mother to, to, to daughter to daughter again. So this is a precious, precious thing that Mary has and she brings. And it, we're told that it's, uh, it's worth 300 denarii. That's roughly one year's wages. So 300 denarii is a, a year's worth of wages. Now, the, I don't know what the, what the, um, the translation rate would be, or trans, uh, the, the comparison rate would be today, but just in, in Kane County, the average household annual income is around $80, $85,000 a year. So just, let's just take that, $85,000. Can you imagine $85,000 in an instant smashed and poured out? No wonder there was such a reaction to this. It's a huge amount of money she just pours out onto Jesus. And that act is what the whole story turns around in its significance. It's an act of extravagant devotion to Jesus. It's an act of worship. In fact, that's what worship is. We sometimes forget that. We think worship is uh, this uh, song time. Sing a few songs, sing a few hymns, uh, come to, come to an, an engage in worship for a few minutes. That's not what worship is, according to the Bible. In the Old Testament, worship was bringing an offering, a sacrifice, a, a living sacrifice, to be sacrificed on the altar, a sacrifice of praise. Romans chapter 12 tells us that we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. So worship is offering, and she is offering the best she has. It's an act of extravagant devotion. In fact, the very word worship comes from the words worth-ship, that which is worthy of devotion and praise. God is ultimately worthy. Okay, so Mary is presented to us here as an example, a model, 
a standard, if you will, for what it means to worship with extravagant devotion to Jesus. And I want to look at three characteristics of her extravagant devotion. First, extravagant devotion to Jesus is visible to others. This might sound obvious, but it's common in our culture for people to talk this way. You know, your faith is your private issue. That's your own personal spirituality, your own religion. It's fine if it works for you, if it's true for you, but don't push that onto others. Don't get too public with that. That's your own private devotion. But in this case, and in our case, all cases, our devotion to Jesus is not merely a private matter. It is a public thing. It is not something we hide away or keep under wraps. It's meant to be visible, to li be lived out loud. Let's look at verses 3 through and 4 once more. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at a table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? Now, we'll get to their objection in a minute, but what I want you to see here is that it's done in public. It's done for all to see. It's unavoidable. Now, this does not mean that Mary does this act in order to be seen. She's not trying to impress people. But it, what it means is this. She is so lost in devotion to Jesus that she's almost unaware of who's watching or what they think. Has that ever happened for you? Have you ever had the experience of being caught up in the wonder of who God is and the sheer magnitude of his love that you just kind of forget yourself? You forget where you are, almost. You, you forget that people are around you. It's not often. My observation is for most of us, we live our lives with a sort of background uh, noise in our soul that we are self-conscious about what people think, sometimes consciously about it. But often it's just sort of, it's just sort of the, the air we breathe, the water we swim in. Social media magnifies this, but we're constantly thinking about, even if we're not thinking about it, if that makes sense, what others see and think of us, their opinion of us. Most of our lives are lived with this, this concern about it. It's a filter through which we evaluate our actions and our behaviors and our words. Have you ever been tempted to hide or to temper, or to tone down your faith, your love for Jesus, because of you, what you think others might think of you? Or have you ever had the experience where maybe in a worship service in church, maybe on a missions trip, maybe in just unlooked for moments in a, a, on, a, on a walk, or where the, reading the Word of God, where you're just caught up in wonder of who He is? overcome with the magnitude of his love for you and you forget and your worship is on display so to speak that's what happens here in the story while everyone's watching and remember who's at this dinner party they aren't a bunch of skeptics they aren't a bunch of people who are hostile to jesus they've been healed by jesus raised from the dead by jesus love jesus this is a this is an insider's dinner party and yet she pours out the best she has on Jesus, and some people see it and don't understand it. This is the second uh, characteristic. Extravagant devotion to Jesus will look foolish and be criticized by many. That will happen. If you are going to be sold out for Jesus, I mean, I don't, I don't mean like, you know, cautiously religious. If you're going to live your life out loud, sold out for Jesus. In fact, a good friend of mine who walked with his wife through cancer and when it said that we made the decision we were going to live our faith out loud in the darkest moments. And they did. And for many people, that was a great source of encouragement and praise. But the truth is, when you live your life out loud for Jesus, some people are going to question. Some are going to say, that, that, that doesn't make sense. That seems like, what are you giving yourself to? You don't really believe that, do you? And maybe this whole thing is, is a false hope that you'd, do better off, you'd be better off you know, moving on from. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, the Apostle Paul says, We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Greeks. Later in chapter 4, he says, We are fools for Christ's sake. To be considered foolish. To look foolish to others. Nobody wants to be called a fool or thought a fool. But are we willing to because of our devotion, our extravagant devotion to Jesus? 
Look at verses 4 and 5 again of Mark 14. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. A couple words here to focus on. The word indignantly. They're not mildly annoyed with Jesus, with this woman. They are indignant. This is ridiculous. This is a mistake. This is foolish. This is a waste. They, in fact, that's the objection. Why was it wasted like that? It could have been sold and given to the poor. And they scolded her. This word scolded is interesting. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Some folks, when you, when you live your life in extravagant devotion to Jesus, even those in the church sometimes are going to say, ho, 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 time out, calm down, don't get carried away. What are you doing? That's what's happening here. The word scolded is a Greek word that means the flaring of the nostrils. That's the root word. It's interesting. They, it, it literally could be like snorted with anger would be a good translation. So they didn't just scold, hey, hey, no, 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 shame on you. Like, I, th I hear the word scold, and I think of my mom when I was a boy. Jeffrey, stop that. It's, it's more of a flaring of the nostrils in anger. They snorted at her. Who likes to be snorted at? Like, <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous. What are you doing that is so wasteful, that is so dumb, that makes no sense? That's the tone of what's going on here. She, remember, she's pouring out the best she has on her Savior, and people who, who are around who are insiders to the Jesus circle are saying, ridiculous. What are you doing? Maybe you felt that. I remember years ago talking to a good friend of mine. He and his wife told the story of when, they, when he decided he was a new believer and he was learning about the principles of giving, that all of his wealth really wasn't his, that he didn't earn it. It belonged to God. It was a gift of grace and that he should give back to God. He said it. It blew him away when he, when he finally realized, it's not how much of my money will I give to God, but how much of God's money will I keep for myself. So he told his wife, honey, we're going to give 10%. Now, just so a frame of reference, the average church-going Christian in America gives around 2 to 3% of their annual income uh, to, to the work of God. So 10% is like the baseline we're given in Scripture. Not to make anybody feel guilty, just to give you a frame of reference. And they were giving less than that, he said. And when he came to his wife and said, we're going to give 10%, she said to him, what are we going to live on, God's grace? <laughs> Which is funny, because he said, well, I guess, yeah. And, and they've told the story about how God has grown their hearts for generosity over the years. She snorted at him. She scoffed, like, that's ridiculous, that's crazy, that's foolish. Nobody wants to be thought a fool. Nobody wants to be snorted at. But are we willing to be out of our extravagant devotion to Jesus? Let's look a little closer at this act of extravagant devotion of Mary. Was it a waste? Was it too much? What's the rule of thumb for a young man who's seeking to buy an engagement ring for his fiance? I remember when I was, uh, when I was looking for rings to buy a ring to give to my now wife, Erin. I was told the rule of thumb was three months salary was a good range. The problem was I was unemployed at the time. So what does that mean exactly, right? But three months salary, they, people use that still today as a, as a rule of thumb. I suppose it depends on how much you make. But think about that. Three months salary to buy a diamond, just a stone, set in a ring. Why? Because this is the, the person I want to spend my life with. I'm pledging myself to them. This is the one I'm committing myself to. Surely they're worth that much. Well, is one year's salary a waste to pour out onto the one who has given his life for you, onto the king of kings? If you, if you think about it, which is crazier? Which is really crazier? To, to pour out the very best you have in devotion to Jesus, the king of all the universe, the judge of all the earth, the Lord of your life, or to hold back most of it for yourself and to give to God what you feel you can spare. If you think about it that way, which makes more sense? Which really adds up? Because when Mary poured out the ointment, she not only poured out the financial value of the ointment itself, she broke the flask. I mean, there's no going back. It's all coming out, right? She's giving it all. She also surrenders that which came with that financial wealth. Security, status, privilege, 
comfort, all those things poured out willingly. And again, which, which makes more sense? The point is this. Very often, what will look foolish or, or strange or odd, what mo- won't make sense from a human perspective, is beautiful from God's perspective. That's exactly what Jesus says it is. He says, it's a beautiful act she's done for me. This is something beautiful done for me. Extravagant devotion to Jesus is never a waste. Extravagant devotion to Jesus is never a waste. I remember years ago when I was a youth pastor in a different church, we had this fundraiser and the challenge by the the leader of our ministry at that time, I was one of the staff members, was that, that we should all pray about what we were willing to give up for the cause of Christ. What is it we're willing to sacrifice? And I had a chance to uh, share the gospel with and reach out to this young man named Chuck. He would lo- Chuck was a, a, an athlete, a high school athlete, a baseball player, a really good baseball player, was a new believer in Christ, and he had this baseball card collection, a really one that his dad had helped him with, a really rare card collection, very valuable card collection. And he came and uh, said he wanted to give up his baseball card collection. Several binders full of cards, rookie cards, mint condition, all in these little plastic cases. And I remember thinking, whoa, this is significant. And I asked him if he was sure. He said he was sure. And he gave that up. He sold that collection to give that money uh, to the cause of Christ. Boy, his father was not happy when he found out about it. And I said, he, was a, he thought he was coerced into it. And Chuck was saying, no, Dad, I want to do this out of love, extravagant devotion to Jesus. So Mary was not crazy. I remember years ago, a, a man who was generous to the cause of the church, but he, he had been through a painful divorce. He had uh, come back to faith in Christ and was really growing, but he had bought and so, uh, built and sold excuse me, several businesses, was worth multiple millions of dollars, and he was very generous to the church and to many other uh, Christian causes and, and organizations. And he said one time, he said, you know, your job as a pastor is to tell me I'm not crazy. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, my business partners think I'm crazy for giving away this much money. My ex-wife thinks I'm crazy, and she's mad and I'm giving away this much money. My friends who aren't believers think I'm crazy. Uh, nobody understands. And so every now and then, could you just tell me a story of life change, of Jesus transforming someone's life, of the gospel, just to remind me that I'm not crazy? I've always thought about that story because for all of us, we may not, might not be multimillionaires, but all of us at one time or another wrestle Am I crazy for believing this? Am I crazy for giving my life to this? No, you're not. You're not crazy. An act of extravagant devotion to Jesus is never wasted. And this brings us to the third point. Extravagant devotion to Jesus will be remembered. This is something when I looked through the story, I hadn't really dug into before. I hadn't really paid attention to what's going on here. Jesus has some remarkable things to say about this woman's act of devotion and worship. He's going to silence those who criticize her, and he's going to uh, praise her act and say some profound things about what it actually means. Let's look at verses 6 through 9. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing, he calls it, to me. That's key. A beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. That's a curious statement, isn't it? We'll talk about that in a minute. And he goes on. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. That last verse, verse 9, if we go back one slide there. That's astounding. Whatever she has done, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what she has done will be told of her. Jesus says, this is so significant, I'm not going to let you or anyone else forget about it. Isn't that amazing? This, this woman, Mary, is held up to us as an example of faith. I'm not going to let anyone forget what she has done. She, it will be told. Why? Not because she's so great, because of what that act actually signifies. All right, let's talk about verse 7 for a minute here. If we go back one slide. Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you, but you won't always have me. Now, this is verse 7. What's he talking about here? Sometimes this verse has been used as an excuse to not care so much about the poor. Ah, the poor are always going to be there. That is not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, he's not arguing for uh, indifference to the poor. 
He's not indifferent to the poor. The scriptures make that plain throughout. And he's not saying that his followers should be indifferent to the poor. What is he saying? He's pointing out the reality that poverty is an ongoing ministry need that we should care about. And he says you can do good for them whenever you want. But this moment in history, prior to his death, is significant. And this opportunity for extravagant devotion really matters. I would put it this way. He's saying you should pursue intimacy with God over activity for God. Or to put it a different way, back to the great commandment, love for neighbor and for the poor flows from love and devotion to God, not the other way around. It is out of our extravagant devotion to Jesus that we care for the poor. And, and with Jesus, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not like Jesus is going, oh, no, you wasted all that ointment. Now what am I going to do? Now how are we going to help the people? God's resources are unlimited. And so pouring ourselves out in devotion to him is not a waste. It's not foolishness. He multiplies those efforts for gospel work. So get the order right. Love for God first. Intimacy with God over activity for God. And he's pointing out this unique moment before his death. Notice he says, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. What does that mean? What does he mean? Isn't Jesus God? Isn't he omnipresent? Yes. Doesn't he say in Matthew 28, before he ascends, I am with you always, even to the end of the age? Yes. So what does he mean? You're not always going to have me. He's talking about this specific moment in history. He is moving toward his death, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, bodily departure from this world. The death of Jesus Christ, is, it's, it's the hinge moment. It's what he came for. He says in Mark 10, verse 45, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The sacrifice, the sacrificial offering of himself for the sins of the world. That's the whole point. And he says, she has unknowingly anointed me for my death beforehand, which is astounding. She's anointed my body for burial. Now, was, was, was Mary aware? Did she know that's what she was doing? I don't think so. The text doesn't give us any indication that's the case. I think what the point of it is this. When we pour ourselves out in extravagant devotion to Jesus, in whatever form, much more goes on in our hearts and in the, the work of God than we could ever imagine. We're told in the Psalms that God inhabits the praises of his people, that when his people come and offer themselves as living sacrifices, God is pleased with that, and he, he does a remarkable work with that. He's, something's going on that she doesn't even know. Now, then he says this, next, next slide, she has done what she could. Done what she could. I've thought about that phrase. She did what she could. Well, what could she do? Well, let's ask it, what couldn't she do? Well, she couldn't go to the Sanhedrin and the chief priests and, and try to negotiate uh, a, a, a truce between them and Jesus. She didn't have that kind of authority or status. She couldn't raise an army to defend her rabbi against his enemies. She didn't have that kind of power or influence. She simply did what she could. All, all she did was all she could. What a great template for you and for me. Do what you can in devotion to Jesus. What can you do? Well, all I can do is give myself. That's all I have. Christina Rossetti's great poem about the lamb, right? What can I give him, poor as I am? I'll give him my heart. I'll give him me. That's all I can do. And so this is what she does. And, and then Jesus has this amazing statement in verse 9. Because of that, I'll be sure that everyone remembers wherever the gospel's preached. Why? N not because Mary's so great, but because of what it symbolizes, because of the power of the gospel. Mary is held up to us as a model for what extravagant devotion to Jesus looks like, and she's actually contrasted with someone else. Let's look at John 12, verses 4 through 6. But Judas Iscariot... One of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charged the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. 
So John tells us that how crazy and sad and tragically ironic is it that Judas is the one who criticizes Mary for her uh, extravagant devotion to Jesus. He agrees to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which, by the way, is about 100 denarii. So for a third of the cost of her act of worship, he's going to betray Jesus. Think about that. The reason, in the very next couple of verses, are the story of Judas's betrayal. There's not an accident that Mark and John, the gospel writers, put those two stories right next to each other. Jesus anointed with his extravagant, costly act of devotion and betrayed for a third the cost of that worship. There's a comparison between Judas, one of the 12 disciples, and Mary. Who gets it right? In fact, I'd like to take a minute and just look at this little contrast, this little table contrasting Mary and Judas. Mary, a woman with no real standing. Judas, a man in that culture, one of the apostles. Mary gave what she could to Jesus. Judas took what he could get for Jesus. Mary blessed her Lord. Judas betrayed his Lord. Mary loved her Lord. Judas used his Lord. Mary did a beautiful thing. Judas did a terrible thing. Mary served him as her Savior. Judas sold him like he was his slave. Mary is no notable forever for her devotion, and Judas notorious forever for his betrayal. What a contrast. I'll put it to you. Which one do you want to be? I want to be like Mary. I want to be like Mary, pouring my life out in extravagant devotion to Jesus. If I'm honest, I hold things back. And so I'll just ask you, what's, what's your alabaster flask? What's the thing you need to smash and break and pour out in devotion to Jesus? What's that which you're holding back? And if you're honest, it's the thing that's holding you back. Jesus says, pour it out in devotion to me and see what I'll do with it. It's worth us thinking about that and reflecting on that. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, the Apostle Paul says this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus is the fragrant offering. Remember this alabaster, this ointment, the pure nard poured out. As, there's fragrance in the room as an offering. And Jesus himself is the fragrant offering for us, for our sakes. Timothy Keller, in his commentary on this uh, passage, uh, puts it this way. He says, Every treasure on earth says, Give up your life to purchase me. Jesus is the one treasure that says, I gave up my life to purchase you. Everything else you would treasure or pursue in this life is going to ask something of you, a sacrifice of you. Give up your life to have me. But the gospel says that God laid down his life to ransom purchase you. You are his treasure because of that. He treasures you because of the cost, the price that he paid. So was it worth it? Not for Mary. I'm going to ask you about this. Think about the, the, about the math here. Is it worth it for the God of the universe, the holy, perfect creator of all that exists, to give up his son for you and for me? For our brokenness and sinfulness? I mean, that doesn't exactly add up. That's not an even trade. Is it worth it for Jesus to lay down his life for those who would betray him, deny him, walk away from him, scoff at him, snort at him? But he did it. Because in God's, God's economy, is not like the world's economy. Those things don't add up the same way. It's crazy from one perspective that a holy and perfect God would do that, but he did. And that's what Mary understood. And Judas never did. This little story tucked in between the plot to kill and the agreement to betray tells about what real worship looks like. And we're still talking about her story 2,000 years later. Let me urge you, Chapel Street brothers and sisters, pour out your life in extravagant devotion to Jesus. Some will think you're foolish, but it is never a waste because he has poured out his life for you. That's what he did on the cross. He poured himself out. He held nothing back for you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this ancient text and this story. We thank you that we still know Mary's name today because you have given this story to us as an example of what it means to live our lives in extravagant devotion to you. Forgive us for holding back.
for being timid and fearful souls. Free us by the power of your grace and your spirit to live as people who are sold out to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.